Aloha ko. Um, this is Hui Alilio. Our ohina we chose was stories from the new Pepa. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, Auntie. The most difficult thing I think for our ohina was actually defining parameters. Um, we wanted to look at everything that you could consider a story, mo'olelo, ka'au, um, very inclusive rather than exclusive. Um, so we actually kind of started with what we were not going to include as a part of a story in this ohina. Um, news types of things, editorials, opinion pieces, columns. Um, and then from there, we got an idea of what we were including all the way from historical narratives to legends, serialized novels, that kind of thing. Um, and then how else we were needing to define scope of search was what we actually could access without totally killing ourselves. I mean, I think we're already killing ourselves. We chose a very <laughs> um, huge ohina, uh, very ambitious. We didn't want to do just a sort of database compilation of what might be in the new PEPA, but we wanted to go as comprehensive as we possibly could. Um, and so we, we put some boundaries on ourselves in terms of what was available online using Papa Kilo first, and then our plan is to move over to those papers that are on Ulukau that are not on Papa Kilo um, to complete the online kind of swath of New Peppa stories. Uh, next, please. So this being so massive and huge um, of a topic to tackle, and because we really wanted to get everything we could, we looked at the years the new people ran. We split them into thirds, um, knowing that some years, like earlier on in the, the early days of new people printing, there would probably be fewer stories there compared to the later 1800s, where you're probably getting a huge quantity, a huge volume of mo'olelo running during certain time periods. Um, but we didn't really know what that was like. We couldn't tell what the landscape was until we got in there. So we just split them up into thirds. And then we decided to go manually, page by page, paper by paper, um, <clears throat> article by article, and hovering over clipped articles to look at headers. And if the header looked like it was definitely a mo'olelo, then we'd throw it into the spreadsheet. And if we weren't sure by the title, then we'd have to read through a little more. Um, the research process is still taking us a very long time and we'll show you in our stats where we're at right now with that. Um, but that's kind of what we decided we were gonna do from the start and we're sticking to it, even though we're <laughs> killing ourselves to get it done, I would say. Um, then from there in, in choosing what we were gonna select for translations, um, we decided we were gonna translate just the beginning of these mo'olelo instead of doing, trying to do them in completion. Um, so we're taking three stories each every week. So that means nine translation, translated stories every week that our team is producing, um, averaging around two pages of side-by-side -side text and translation. And then because most of the stories that we're choosing are much longer than those two pages, we're trying to find the right place to cut off the mo'olelo um, to leave people wanting more, to give them enough to be pulled in, drawn into the story, um, and hopefully get curiosity peaked enough for people to click onto the actual article to read more. Um, we've also tried as a group to balance out Hawaiian stories with foreign stories, um, although that's been not super easy all the time depending on what's being printed um, from month to month. Sometimes we have long segments of time where we don't really get a Hawaiian story being printed in the newspapers. Um, but we're trying to balance it out and be aware of what kinds of things we're choosing to translate. So we're going for at least one Hawaiian and at least one foreign from each of us every week. That's kind of our anchor. There are a lot of limitations in our research because we have not gotten through every page of printed newspaper yet. Um, so we don't have a 
broad sweep of Mo'olelo across the entire um, 115 years of print. Our uh, translated pieces are mostly from the beginning of our time chunks that we sectioned off into thirds. Um, so you'll see some of that a little bit later, but it's not um, evenly dispersed across the 115 years, although we are trying to get diversity of content. We also had to make some decisions about including like the Olaloho Akaka or Olelo Vehevehe um, up front. And so some, we're kind of going case by case. Um, if the prelude, the foreword by the author is of real value, either to the storyline or to getting a glimpse into what um, the author or translator, um, how he or she approached the actual work, the actual translation, then we tried to include those things that seemed um, important or very interesting. And if it was more like Mo'oku um, how setting up the character, the main character of the story, but it didn't actually get you into storyline, then we decided to leave that out of our translation and start at the exciting part of the Mo'olelo, of the story. Next, Auntie. Mahalo. So where we're at currently, um, we have pulled into our master spreadsheet about 650 stories, only completing uh, 30 years of page by page, article by article searching. So our guess is that we're about 25% done with this Ohina in terms of building out the spreadsheet into completion. Um, we would like to figure out how to get that 25% to 100%, knowing that that's not going to happen by the end of the time that we have allotted for Ohina too. So that's a fun conversation we are wrestling with right now. Um, some years in those 30 years that we've searched, some years have fewer than 10, mo'olelo, 10 stories printed over those 12 months, and some have more than 60. It totally depends um, how many papers are running at one time and what the editors of those papers were focused on. As far as translations, 133 stories, most of those being longer than what we translated. Um, about a third, a little less than a third are Hawaiian in origin, the other two thirds being foreign. And I also pulled out just how many actually have the author or the translator given by name. Um, it's kind of an interesting stat to see what that's like. And we have around 246 pages um, currently translated. Growing every day. Next, Auntie. Mahalo. Uh, I'm going to really let the boys kind of roll on what's super exciting about this topic, but I just threw out some things um, to get us started. Mostly it's diversity. I mean, every story, every day, we're dealing with different things, different language, different style, different writers, different subject matter, different country of origin. You can see on, on these examples here on this slide, there's two versions of Cinderella, one the original Chinese version. It doesn't say whether or not it was translated straight from Chinese or if it was translated off of a translation. But then you also have that next to the English Cinderella version story. And these are not the same at all. Um, just from the beginning, first couple of pages, very different, similar, but different storylines. Um, so we get to see some of that. Next, Mahalo. A lot of our stories are translated, not from English, but directly from their source language into Hawaiian. So Snow White translated straight from German. Um, translated from Danish, Olelo Danesika. This Lahui Ho in the middle, it says, was translated from French into English and then from the English into Hawaiian. We have one, Rayanahu from Chinese, um, and then a lot of Arabian Nights stories from the 1001 um, Nights. Just cool, interesting stuff. That is. Next, Auntie. 
Kahalo. Again, with this Kahalo Nani, you can see the German text original on the top left. Then it went straight into Hawaiian from there. When we, when we match up the Hawaiian to the English translation of the German, it comes out pretty darn close. Um, you can see where Hawaiian style of storytelling comes in and Hawaiian description language kind of influences the way that the translation comes out, which is one of the coolest things that I think um, I love to see in the work that we're doing. And then on this far right side, you can see um, one of these preludes to a story um, that actually describes the approach taken by the author slash translator and how it's really important to choose the words that you use in your translations um, to make it interesting for the reader and have it make sense, but also be in enticing or no, if, if you would, mm. uh, that kind of thing. Okay, moving forward. We each kind of chose some, some highlights to talk about um, with you folks. Oh, I guess that's me. Um, yeah, this was especially cool for me because I wasn't as familiar. Let me turn on. Oh, that's what I look like. I wasn't as familiar with Ka'au as my two partners. Um, so super interesting learning the Ka'au language. Uh, kind of like how we had to figure out the 1864 jargon. It was a uh, the same thing for me here. So it was a really cool learning experience. And Ka'o is just super cool. I think a lot of people are, probably think uh, New Pepe is boring, especially the younger people. But I think if we show them, you know, what really they can find. And I read this to my kids all the time and they love it. They love these stories. Just got to dumb it down a little bit. But, um, but this was one story I chose. I don't know if you guys want me to read it to you or not, but. Uh, this was Kaikumahine Kahune Ne, which I translated to be the Swan Maiden. Uh, it was a real fantastical story about like enchanted handkerchief with droplets of blood that spoke for the mother. It just weird speaking horses and and it was all captured in Hawaiian, which is I think is just so cool. Um, another one was I go to the next. Oh, it says ha. Oh, Auntie, on the uh, last slide is hidden. If you can um, unhide it. How do I do that? Ah. Uh, shoot. Uh, they, I, oh, good. No need. Color mine. It was uh, about some black people and their masters. And that one. Uh, going back to what really is a call. I had a hard time. I was getting busted early on about what qualifies as a call because I had a, I have a, not a supremely clear picture, but at least what I believe a call to be. And uh, certain religious things, I thought if they weren't really story-like, then I didn't deem them to be call. But if it had a kind of story feel to it, then I, I would translate it. But, um, and this was one of the things I kind of was on the fence about because it was just an account of what was happening. It was a current event, really. But it was just their take on the current event. But I chose this, uh, and uh, Kamuela always says to Hokal, Hokal, to try and uh, take the liberty to, you know, embellish and make it fanciful and all this stuff. and. So this one, I put in some funny words, uh, how I thought those black Negro slaves would have spoken to their masters at the time. And I wanna call it quickly, shot that down and changed that to a <laughs> more of a modern day approach. It was just a, a little laugh that I knew wasn't gonna make it to the final cut. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a, the coolest thing for me is just the wide range of different languages that you see. like so many from the 1001 Arabian Nights and, and uh, the Brother Grimm story, a lot of them. And uh, it's funny, they always kind of follow that same kind of, uh, the father dies and it's always grim and leaves everyone in despair. And 
it just seems like that's the traditional thing to do but um i thought it was really cool how it was really obvious how much they embrace the that these pa'au in general whether hawaiian or foreign or english because it ran for so dang long and there's just so many um so it was cool to watch different people's translations and and uh, interpretations of these stories and it's from the original source so yeah i won't i won't bother reading it to you guys it's it's available on uh hawaii ulu's website <laughs> no it's not <laughs> okay well, and also that the fact that that was that comic was included yeah Avi? yeah yeah it was a drawing included which kind of um helps us not romanticize the the, the past that was included in the newspapers i actually came across uh a version of the and I forgot to mention this to you guys, but in the beginning it had a picture, like a, a painting, and it had like angels and wings, and it was very uh, uh, biblical, and I was kind of surprised to see it. I'll try and pull it up again for you guys. But this is Haas. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the main value of this Ohina was that it, it changes story. We're getting three different stories, each from three different time periods, three different decades every week. So it never really gets dry. It's, um, it was always exciting. And the diversity, as Kapolei was saying, was, is um, so impressive stories coming in from all over the world, different languages. But I also think what's cool is this story that we just translated, I think this past week, in the last two weeks, Gilbert the Mighty or something like this. And how it's, um, of course we can find place names like London and, and uh, England, but the other names, personal names, the name of the forest, Hedi uh, Ele Ele, Omole Ili, which is the name of the hotel or the inn where they stay. Weren't, we weren't really able to find the, uh, some of the more personal or at least more localized place names. And that's for a lot of those stories that we collect. A lot of the more that we collect, we can't really find an English translation or a translation in, the, in different languages. At least on the internet, at least a Google search won't really turn up those names. Even if we try different spellings, even if we try variant uh, pronunciations or whatever. Um, so what that might mean, I don't know if it's, um, I can say this definitively, but it might mean that at, at least in terms of public Kilo being an open source archive, some of these stories might only be held in, in, in the Hawaiian version where they're uh, original versions or their translations into another language, English um, and other languages. Um, might be behind, they might not be open source, they might not be accessible online. But then you have the Hawaiian version, uh, open source archived, available on Papa Kilo, which is kind of cool. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> For this slide, at least. That would be next, right? Okay. Yes, please. Oh, a couple of lights. Yeah, back to me. I couldn't choose just one, of course, um, but just, just as an example of the diversity of what we are looking at from week to week. You have a Mo'olelo Hawaii Kiako Oku, and it starts tracing back the origins of this, <clears throat> of this story to the previous story printed, Kamakamahi Ai, who was the grandfather of Kyako Ku and it explains that whole how this mo'olelo how this story fits in with the previous one and it and it links up to certain parts of look at this newspaper printed on this day and in this mokuna and it'll explain what's happening at the start of Kyako Ku. Very interesting from that to like a murder detective mystery kind of novel 
um, Keaka and Megila. Then we had one from Huahine, Tahiti, and we were trying to track down the original story and, and do, I, I don't know how many hours we spent trying to do research um, around finding the original, getting our hands on the original versions or English translations of these stories. Um, cannot track down this kupua matani omao or the keiki ali'i ahubarara. Can't find, can't find that anywhere. Um, but like I said, it's here. Then going from that to an Italian story translated by Thomas Monu Poe um, into one of the Tarzan series, one about Tarzan's son, Jack, and um, just, just such a wide range of things that we're looking at every week and very exciting, I think, to our group. Great. That's it for us. Okay. Do I, uh, can I add something to this presentation? Yes, yeah, go into discussion. I'll take this down and we can. <clears throat> oh, not so much a discussion. Um, just to, <clears throat> just to add on that, um, sorry, my internet's going in and out. So I'm just going to leave my video off. But um, just to add that a lot of times when this group found stories that were brought over from other languages, that they really did spend a lot of time. And a lot of time when I'm looking at those translations, I get to see um, the original names that were uh, written in there, whether it was French or Danish or you know German or, or whatever language it came out in. Um, Everybody would try their best to say it, and Ha'a would tell them that we're all wrong, uh, to which point then he would say it again, and we think that he sounds wrong, but, you know, what do we know? <clears throat> but um, th there was a lot, a lot, a lot of research done in the off times, as all the other groups were, but um, I think oftentimes when, uh, when we look at translations, or when, even when you read Hawaiian stuff in the newspapers, you, you get to these these names you're like ah yeah well whatever his name is i don't really care i, I know that guy he's the main guy and then you just keep going so nobody really pays attention to what those names are just kind of skip over it and keep going like a lot of times in class they'll tell you okay let's read cavello and then you get to the first melee and they're like oh and, and there's a melee okay well just keep going like there's so much you know value in all of these small bits and pieces details that um all too often you just kind of run past so that you can get to learning more, um, you know, sentence patterns or cool words, whatever. But um, just that small little detail of trying their best to find the names and put those names in whatever uh, language they're originally meant to be in, <clears throat> I thought was a really um, big detail for me as a reader that they didn't bring up. Um, and I can only guess at how many hours and uh, days and whatever has been spent on trying to track down these ridiculous names that I would have never, ever found. So just to add that as well. Does anybody have questions or something to say about today? I have just uh, a thing to add in to say, I know that Kamuela encourages them to ho'oka'au, you know, to maintain a sense of story and so do I. And we often, something that's different in this team than in the other ones, it's sort of a need to make sure that the English flows in a way that engages the reader. These are meant to be, they have a different sort of foundation than a news report or a, a speech even. You know, there's a different tenor to it. And so trying to maintain that, a lot of times it's simple wordplay back and forth, but that's sort of another level of challenge that is maybe more apparent in this one than in some of the other ones. Um, can I ask a question? Um, oh, by the way, total FOMO on your uh, Ohina. Uh, but uh, when you guys are looking at the stories translated from other languages into Hawaiian, I know you said that like only 32% of the stories actually show who the, the author is and probably, yeah. So when you look at the ones translated into Hawaiian, is it, were you able to get a sense either from names or just from style of how many of these were Hawaiian translators 
going from either English or other languages into Hawaiian, because I assume there's both Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians translating foreign stories into Hawaiian. So did you get any sense of um, difference in style between the two? Or are there just not enough names to make any of that clear? Like, and were the, the Hawaiian translators, did they have a way of translating concepts that maybe the um, people who, well, actually, I don't know, maybe they all had a fabulous grasp of Hawaiian, I don't know. But I'm just wondering if you noticed any differences. Uh, the, uh, the most obvious thing to me was uh, idioms translated into Hawaiian, but remained, had a strong sense of English to it still. It was very obvious that that was an English idiom translated. But also th like things, I, like I come across all the time and I, I was making an argument uh, to Kamuela just the other week that I believe that this was a, a, a false, trans like it was an incorrect translation. And it was, uh, well, I don't, we haven't met on it yet, on a call, but um, shoot, Kamuela, what was the word? I don't know. You were wrong, though. I? Yeah. <laughs> he still thinks I'm wrong. It was, uh, oh, shit, I can't remember. But I, I was saying that I'm pretty sure that this is a, a incorrect translation, that they took this word, which means something in English, and made it to Hawaiian, and it really had no ground there. It was my argument. It was probably a weak argument, but there are other uh, examples of it. I think the idioms are the most obvious thing. But sometimes it's outright beautiful. Like how I came across some articles that were so beautifully written. Maybe they're just amazing in Hawaiian, or maybe that was a, a, a native translator. I'm not, it, yeah, I guess we'll really never know. But some of them have signed their names. But I guess we still wouldn't know if they're really. <laughs> <laughs> it's all guesswork. Um, but does, is there any indication of non-Hawaiian translators have, that have shown up, team? The column when we had to fill out if the author is known or not, most of mine were unknown. But um, when we did get a name, most of mine were pen names, like Hawaii, Kaimanakila. But Moses Manu Esquire showed, showed up a lot in my, uh, in my era. Oh, no. And so Hina, I think for me, I, I can't, it's too early to make those correlations as much as I want to. Uh, um, and you know, what I would say from sort of a, just a long exposure to, to dealing with translations is that most of them are Hawaiians who went somewhere and you know, either got inspired by the stories or fluent enough in the language. That was something that was, there was a vocation it was a real possibility. There's a number of uh, young translators that were identified. Uh, the guy in the 60s who passes away young, but he does a block of the Moses Manu is another one. Folks who translation became sort of a, a vocation. Um, I don't really know other than a bunch of the Bible translations and things, especially in the early papers, um, of a lot of legend or story translators who weren't Hawaiian. And it didn't occur to me until you asked the question, but for the most part, these are Hawaiians who, because I think it took a certain fluency and a deafness to be able to take a story. Um, so you can question their grasp of English sometimes. <laughs> Did they really get this? It's 20,000 leagues under the sea. There's sometimes that I think, did they really understand what they were you know, getting in English? Some of that is pretty detailed stuff. But the English that they were drawing from was a little fuzzy, too, because it was written in French. Anyway, not to go on, but that's a whole field of study that would be fascinating. And the idioms would be a port of entry then, because those are the kinds of things. Bringing them across the bridge is always, you know, one of the trickiest, as you know, getting the Hawaiian idioms out you know, into English. Good stuff. I feel like you I, have a really um, probably the, the insight that covers the broadest range of the Ohina. Have you seen any correlations? 
No, I was quite happy with your responses. <laughs> it's quite an amazing um, index you guys are building. It's really exciting. It is. A, a, I really hope we can continue it into next Ohina. <laughs> plug, plug. <laughs> That's the video. Am I? You did? No. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, there was a plea yeah. to carry on and finish and carry the project forward. And, you know, old Captain Raisinhart was medium open to the suggestion, but it wasn't going anywhere. Um, the thing is, every one of these Ohina is going to be a launch pad for a whole bunch of other projects. And partly the fact that they are not completed is going to add value. How's that? Thank you.